Welcome to Open Minds Radio with Alejandro Rojas. Open Minds Radio is your UFO news authority, presenting evidence and the latest news regarding the UFO phenomenon. Here's your host, Alejandro Rojas. Hello, it is Alejandro. Welcome to Open Minds Radio, your UFO news authority. This is Alejandro Rojas, and we have another great show today. You know what? I don't know why. I, I always say this too. I just get so excited about our guests. And this week, I'm definitely really excited about our guests. I'm sorry. I get so excited all the time. I'm just excitable. And that is Steve Volk. And he is a gentleman who is a journalist. We talked about him last week a bit. He wrote a book called Fringeology. And its subtitle is How I Tried to Explain Away the Unexplainable and Couldn't. You know, he's a journalist. His family talked about ghosts. He's like, yeah, right, you know, and he's kind of uh, takes a typical journalist or took the typical journalist kind of attitude. And uh, he looked into this stuff and he found all of the credible stuff. And guess where he found the credible UFO information? Right here on Open Minds Radio. Pretty cool, dudes. But anyway, he's got a book out there. It's made some news. He's gotten on uh, Huffington Post. He wrote a story on. He's got... Uh, some stories out there. So that's really exciting. His book actually tackles, of course, ghost stories because that's how it all started from his family, ghost stories. But he does talk about UFOs, um, psychics, near-death experiences, and other paranormal stuff that he just found. You know, wow, there's a lot of credible stuff. There's some science done around some of these subjects. And why do people run away from these subjects? Why do they make fun of them? Um, you know, why does society have such a problem talking about the paranormal, a question that has perplexed us here at Open Minds for decades? We've been doing this business for nearly 150 years now, and every year we wonder that same question. Actually, it's been a lot less than that, but it feels like a long, long time, a long journey, probably because past lives. We were probably doing this paranormal research in past lives, in many past lives. And uh, I think he talks about past lives in his book. So that's that's. Uh, if you're doubting me, if you're like, yeah, right, dude, past lives, go check out his book. And he'll talk about some of the information that may show you there is possibly some legitimacy to that study as well. So this is going to be a lot of fun talking to Steve. Um, he's a really great guy, a great researcher. And, of course, as my listeners especially, our listeners appreciate, you know, kind of middle of the road, taking a look at everything and being unbiased and, and weighing the evidence here or there. So that's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, of course, we've had some MUFON guests on lately, some people who are going to be speaking at the MUFON Symposium this July 29th to the 31st in Irvine, California. Uh, we're looking forward to being there and checking that out and having a booth and Signing stuff. Um, we'll sign your T-shirt, even if you don't ask us to. We'll just run up there and sign it and uh, put "Open Minds was here," so you remember us. And we're also going to be in Roswell uh, from July 1st to the 4th because that is the famous Roswell Festival. Lots of stuff going on, and we cover daily UFO news every day uh, to let you know about the UFO stuff going on all around the world. And we have. This incredible news correspondent who's with us every week. Ladies and gentlemen, help me give a warm welcome to Jason McClellan. Jason, how are you? Good. Thanks, bud. That was quite warm. There's people clapping all over the place. Hooray. They're trying to drive and clap while they're listening to the well, podcast. Well, I certainly hear it. <laughs> Hello, Alejandro, and greetings to all of our listeners. This is your Open Minds News Brief for Monday, June 20th, 2011. And Alejandro, I share your enthusiasm for today's guest. Yes. And so I feel I must start off the news with a story about our wonderful guest today. Great. So a Philadelphia reporter recently took a journalistic look into the paranormal. In an effort to understand the unexplainable, Steve Volk put his journalistic skills to use and spent three years researching paranormal phenomena from a variety of angles and sources, according to phillyburbs.com. And the result of his multi-year research are in his new book. As Alejandro mentioned, the book is Fringology, How I Tried to Explain Away the Unexplainable and Couldn't. 
In a recent interview with Philly Post, Falk was asked about the percentage of things that are truly unexplainable. He responds by pointing to UFO studies that show how a low percentage of UFOs remain unidentified. And similar information was presented by someone we've had on the show before, uh, also a journalist, Leslie Kane, author of UFOs, Generals, Pilots, and Government Officials Go on the Record. After a 10-year investigation, Kane concluded that 95% of all UFO sightings can be explained as ordinary phenomena, leaving 5% of the sightings unexplainable. Falk set out to gain a better understanding of paranormal topics. Phillyburbs.com points out that Falk is no closer to having all the answers about the paranormal, but he's fine with that. Through his book, he hopes to spark discussion and debate and hopes skeptics and believers will learn to listen and learn from each other. And I have not read the book. I'm actually really excited to read the book, and I can't wait for the interview. Yeah, I haven't read the whole thing. I've read the UFO part, the introduction, and other pieces and parts. But I'm I'm really excited to sit down, and I know I'm just going to sit down in one setting and read it to beginning to end. It's a great read. He's a great writer. It's a lot of fun, um, and it's I'm really excited about the book. It's it's great. And I get excited w- when people do this. You know, journalists or other people happen to sort of casually look into paranormal paranormal related topics, and they get hooked. Yeah. You know, they, they have a response they didn't expect to happen, and they just, mm-hmm. it sort of overtakes them. They're all, wow, I didn't realize there was so much here. And I was certainly like that. That's one of the reasons, you know, I kind of relate to the book, because I was a journalism student when I really got into this stuff, and so and I didn't really put too much into it. But then, you know, when I really started looking into it, it was like, holy moly, there's something here, Martha. And with this top, with the UFO topic and, and any other topic, really, it's sort of refreshing when someone comes in with a fresh perspective and a truly sort of journalistic approach to it. Mm-hmm. They're coming in with a fresh set of eyes, um, no knowledge on the subject, yeah. and they're just looking at the facts that they can dig up. Yeah. That's always great. And it's great to hear from you listeners because sometimes we hear from the listeners who are like, you know, I wasn't really... I put much into stake into this subject either but i heard an interview with uh, a guest of yours and and i've really gotten into it and that's wonderful i love to hear that absolutely well we've talked uh oh it's not really a lot but we've talked uh, a little bit about seti over the past few weeks uh, a recent budget deficit hampered the SETI Institute's effort to scan the skies for extraterrestrial frequencies, causing operations at their Allen Telescope Array in California to be suspended. Fortunately for SETI and other researchers, though, the search continues. While their Allen Telescope Array is inactive, SETI continues to operate. University of California Berkeley astronomers recently announced a listening project in progress that involves pointing the Robert C. Byrd Green Bank Telescope in West Virginia at 86 planets that have been selected as worlds most likely to resemble Earth, with the hopes of detecting alien signals. The data collected from this project will be analyzed by a network of computers running SETI software called the SETI at Home Project. But search efforts aren't isolated to the United States. Europe's Low Frequency Array, or LOFAR, came online last year and hopes to complement SETI's search for signals, f- signals from, uh, that could point to signs of extraterrestrial life. The world.org describes LOFAR as uh, cons- it consists of fields of antennas spread out over five European countries. And while many radio telescopes scan for signals at higher frequencies, LOFAR is designed to aim at the lower, noisier bands. Mm-hmm. So astronomers are wor- working with LOFAR, hope that uh, SETI can get, ba- get back online completely soon because they feel that their efforts work nicely with SETI's because then they can cover more ground. Mm-hmm. Looking at larger, larger frequency bands, more, more coverage, but still, they acknowledge that it's sort of a crapshoot. But yeah, yeah, I knew people would be coming to SETI's rescue. You know, people get excited about SETI all over the world, um, more so, unfortunately, than you know some of the grassroots kind of UFO investigations, which I think are a better investment. In fact, I think it was Bernard Hage, but it was a, a well-known astronomer who said, you know people who are actually investigating ufos will probably find the smoking gun before we get a signal from somewhere but um it's interesting it's always good that people are continuing to be interested in looking for et well and it's it's interesting how the SETI news the news about their their budget problems it still is making headlines 
they still see it reported as it's something fresh, something yeah. that just happened when it happened uh, more than a month ago. <laughs> right. And, you know, I this is just my, my thought, but I assume SETI is appealing for headlines because it's a scientific organization. Mm -hmm. it, there are other organizations looking for extraterrestrial life. I mean, NASA, almost every public university, um, but they have search for extraterrestrial intelligence in their name. That's what they are. Yeah. So I think when they see the science organization and a lot of, I think that's why it's still making headlines because I think there are a lot of news organizations out there that had no idea there was an organization searching for extraterrestrial intelligence. Probably. Yeah. I mean, it's just such old news to us, but you're probably right. There are probably people all over the place um, thinking, wow, there are actually scientists doing this. Right. Well, as we've stated before, I certainly wish them luck and hope they get back to what they do. But again, I would like to see money going to other efforts, but they need money too. You know, and I kind of get this image in my head of, you know, them getting a message and it says, we're right behind you. And they turn around and there's a UFO like um, Mars attacks or something. This big silver. I would they appreciate should have that added that to Mars attacks. Write the writers. We're right behind you. Yeah, Mars Attacks too. Excellent. Well, New Zealand has proven itself to be quite the UFO hotspot, and lately the city of Rotorua seems to be inundated with UFO sightings. Witnesses have reported many UFOs in the sky above Rotorua lately. These UFOs have varied in appearance and have demonstrated various behaviors. The Daily Post has been publishing stories about the sightings, and these stories have resulted in additional witnesses sending in their own eyewitness accounts, photos, and videos to the Daily Post. In response to one of these videos, a reader suggested that the object in question could be the space shuttle because at the time the video was taken, the space shuttle was re-entering the atmosphere. With most of these sightings, most of these sightings that are reported, uh, readers like to respond with their opinions of what the unknown aerial objects could be. The suggestions sometimes are plausible explanations, while other times they are far, far stretches by people trying to force an identification to make sense of something unknown. And I watched the video of this one particular object in the sky that uh, one reader suggests could be the space shuttle. And it's certainly possible because it's moving pretty quickly through the sky. And I've seen the space shuttle in the sky, not re-entering, but when it was in space. And in space, it was moving quite fast. But mm -hmm. this was supposedly when it was re-entering from a mission, burning through the sky. But just a, a month ago, there was another video from the same place. Um, and the light just kind of sat there above the trees and it moved a little bit one way and stayed there and then moved back and that is certainly not a space shuttle but lots of different UFO sightings in this area um, like I said different behaviors different shapes different movements it's interesting too from one city we keep hearing about this right and fortunately for them and, and for everybody the local press seems to cover it quite a lot unfortunately for us it's hard to say the name of the town and Hopefully we're getting it right, Rotorua. 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 But yeah, hopefully there's, it, it is really interesting that they're having so much activity. And it seems to be, you know, yeah, why is it just a big craze in the area where everybody's looking? Um, that doesn't seem to make sense because you don't, you know, it's not like whole towns typically get real excited about something like that. Yeah. Well, I and as I mentioned to you, Alejandro, that... Uh, when the Daily Post has been posting these stories, along with the stories of the sightings, they posted a poll that asked their readers, do you believe in aliens? And 80% have responded, yes, they believe in aliens. Which is great, and I know you and I have talked about this, and that's probably true here too, but I don't know if those numbers would come through if you talk to people in person. Certainly an online poll that's uh, kind of secret but I know when you talk to people in person, they're not so quick to admit that they yeah. accept the idea that extraterrestrial life is out there. Especially if they're in a group of people. Right. Um, you know, they don't want their friends to know necessarily. Right. The default response is to mm -hmm. laugh it off and wait and see and what other people respond. Yeah. And it's always good to break that down, you know, um, do you believe in extraterrestrials and then do you believe that, uh, you know, UFOs are extraterrestrial? That's always interesting because... And then again, the other one they like to throw in there is, do you believe extraterrestrials are here? Yeah. Have visited Earth or are here now? Because the numbers vary and that's the one I get really interested in. Right. 
We saw a, a recent poll. There are polls all the time, but mm -hmm. we saw a recent one that had fairly high numbers for people uh, feeling that extraterrestrials are here with us now. Yeah. And I don't remember what that was. Me either. Well, exciting. All right. Very much. On to Costa Rica, a tour guide captured a video of what could be a UFO either above or on top of a volcano in Costa Rica. The tour guide saw a shiny reflection coming from the top of the arenal volcano, something he's never seen before. So he took out his camera to record video of the strange occurrence. It's possible that the reflection was from a person on top of the volcano, but as Inside Costa Rica points out, climbing the arenal volcano is illegal and it's surrounded by a national park with restricted access. This video was shown on the local news and is currently being analyzed. Yeah, and it, I mean, it, whatever it is, it's on the rim up there. I, and uh, It looks like it's on the rim. Yeah. It's possible it could be floating behind it, but yeah. it's probably on top, right on the rim. Yeah. So, yeah, something big and reflective up there. It's interesting. It is interesting. Mm -hmm. And the individual who took this video works for um, Caravan Tours, which is a very large tour company in Costa Rica. I'm, in fact, going to be using them later this really? year for a Costa Rica trip. Cool. They're very, very popular. They do lots and lots of tours c consistently. So um, I don't know how long this guy work has worked for Caravan Tours, but he's there all the time. Yeah, and the he says story he's said never he's seen there this, all the so. time. Yeah, and had never seen that. Right. So it's an interesting one, and I don't know uh, if UFOs are attracted to volcanoes or not, but we have another UFO volcano story. Many witnesses observed stra strange lights and objects above a volcano in Chile as it erupted on June 5th. One witness managed to capture a photo of a UFO above the er erupting volcano. Other photos and videos were allegedly taken, but according to ElTiempo.com, experts have yet to authenticate this evidence. Hmm. And that one was actually an object in the air, mm -hmm. in the sky, sort of to the side of a UFO as it, it was erupting, or as a volcano was yeah. erupting. Yeah, I know in Mexico, uh, supposedly they've gotten videos of uh, UFOs near volcanoes, um, but it does seem to be somewhat of a popular thing. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, maybe they like the warmth. Space is cold. They're warming up next to a warm volcano. Well, and it could be, you know, like, again, there could be lots of explanations, but yeah. cer certain things tend to tend themselves to uh, have higher photos and videos of, of UFOs. Like, there are lots of UFO sightings around the 4th of July. And yeah. while that could be because there are a lot of fireworks in the sky, yeah. it could also be that more people are looking up to the sky at that One point. One to that point. So with volcanoes, yeah. more people are watching an er erupting volcano. There's lots of live cams on volcanoes, too. Right. And that's where people get UFO uh, videos often. So... That would make a lot of sense, that there's cameras on volcanoes a lot. That's why we get them so much. Right. Well, I have a, another story. I get excited when I hear things like this, but a professor at Penn State is searching for Earth-like planets and is optimistic about finding a planet or planets out there capable of sustaining life. Jim Casting is a distinguished professor of geosciences in Penn State's College of Earth and Mineral Sciences and is an expert in atmospheric evolution. Before joining Penn State, Casting was a research scientist at NASA's Ames Research Center, and he has become one of the foremost experts on planetary habitable zones. He even wrote a book called How to Find a Habitable Planet. <laughs> Casting says that lack of funding is a big obstacle in the search for extraterrestrial life. He recently told Penn State Live, what hurt our funding is the previous administration's interest in putting men back on the moon and trying to send them to Mars. Also right now, a lot of astronomers are more interested in researching the Big Bang and dark energy as well as gravitational waves. We need to convince more of them to be interested in planets and the search for extraterrestrial life. Casting is just one professor in a growing trend of university scientists searching for habitable planets and extraterrestrial life. Yeah, it's kind of cool. It's kind of like, I wonder if that's going to be a major, major, major soon. I mean, it's like you could go to any university and you can study extraterrestrial life and and how to uh, discover extraterrestrial life, it's becoming so popular. Extremely popular. I've, I've actually had conversations with people recently um, who I just met, and when they find out 
what I do, they say, oh, our daughter is thinking of going into astrobiology. Really? So, wow. And astrobiology, as mm-hmm. we've talked about, really in, in mainstream universities, it is a new field. Yeah. And ASU, Arizona State here in our hometown, happens to be uh, at the forefront of this. But I think you're right. I think astrobiology and these other scientific fields of looking for extraterrestrial life is going to become quite common. Which is exciting. And uh, I mean, of course, manned space flight is very exciting. But um, searching for extraterrestrial life doesn't necessarily mean you need manned uh, space flights. It's probably easier with robots and rovers and things like that. And if we focused on, for instance, looking for life on Mars or the moon, going to those places where there's water or more likelihood of it, who knows? Maybe that would that would, you know, be more fruitful. Uh, And it's always, of course, exciting to think about what will happen when that happens. But it's you know, I think also we heard from Nick Pope, who was at the um, Royal Society of Science, you know, when they had their astrobiology conference and how you know, up on stage or in public, these guys don't want to acknowledge that uh, they have anything to do with UFOs or think about UFOs or have any opinion. But behind the scenes, when he went to dinner with them, when he enjoyed a pint at the pub, you know, they were willing to say that, yeah, we're into UFOs and we follow that stuff. And he was surprised, he said, uh, at how many of these scientists really knew a lot about UFO research and UFOs. That's why I love seeing these professors at these universities where that is their main focus Mm -hmm. and it's known that that's their main focus they talk about it they write books about it and then it becomes more accepted maybe there'll be secret ufo societies where they can get together and talk ufos but they uh you know take a pledge not to share who believes in what that already exists my friend oh my gosh And Alejandro will get to the last story for today. A 30-year-old one farmer claims to have been hospitalized after an encounter with a UFO in Manipur, India. The Assam Tribune reports that the alleged incident took took place on the afternoon of June 15th. And according to the witness, he was shooting video of a fish farm with his cell phone when he suddenly saw the UFO in the sky. He claims that the UFO sped towards him, resulting in in an electric shock that rendered him unconscious. After regaining consciousness, he returned home, and his family took him to the hospital where he was treated and released the same day. But in the article published by the Assam Tribune yesterday, the witness said he had not fully recovered from his UFO encounter yet. Critics of the video footage suggest the UFO was nothing more than a glitch in the camera resulting from uh, shooting directly into the sun. However, there's been no official explanation for the UFO or for the physical reaction claimed by the witness. What do you think? We've seen that glitch of the sun a lot. And if you were to go out there, people, and and video the sun, um, it happens a lot. You get a dark spot in the middle of the sun, and a lot of people think that's UFOs, but it's not. It's a defect of the camera. Right, and that's certainly more likely to happen with, you know, a lower quality uh, phone because that is a lower quality camera. Did it look like he was shooting at the sun, though? I remember looking at this, and I don't remember uh, thinking, oh, he's shooting right at the sun. It's difficult to tell from the the video that we saw because it's so cut together and weird. There's some interview with the guy, and Mm -hmm. so it's hard to tell. It really didn't look like direct into the sun, but unsure. Yeah, and then he gets sick. Yeah, yeah, interesting reaction. He apparently fell back and and, uh, knocked himself out. Mm Mm-hmm, ouch. Yep, Be careful. Yep, be careful when you're (laughs) shooting UFOs. I know it's it's difficult because you get really excited and the and adrenaline gets going, but mm-hmm. but I guess it's hard not to uh, pass out if the UFO zooms at you. Yeah, that's kind of scary. Always practice safe UFO hunting. Safe UFOing. Yep. yep, absolutely. Well, that is it for the news for today, Alejandro. Be sure to check out these stories and more at OpenMinds.tv, your source for UFO-related news. I'm Jason McClellan, your Open Minds news correspondent, and you've been briefed. Back to you, Alejandro. All right. Thank you, Jason. So a couple of the uh, feature stories that we've put up, we've talked already uh, last week a lot about Steven Spielberg and and Reagan and uh, Reagan's comment during uh, the showing of the E.T. at the White House in 1982. And we have the guest list up. I told you we'd have that up, and, and that is up now. Um, I have a review of Super 8 up. It was awesome. I liked it. Go check it out. We also have more information on the Argentinian Air Force UFO Commission. So they've actually started the commission. 
They've stated their mission, which is to document, analyze, and study unidentified phenomena in an orderly, systematic, and truthful manner by means of conventional control systems on the airspace under the national jurisdiction. So that's really cool. This is coming from Argen the Argentinian Air Force. They're actually starting a commission of officers who are going to be looking into the UFO subject. They're going to be studying um, cases. They're getting a website up. They have a cool little logo up already that we have at the website. And this is the breakthrough, uh, another breakthrough, is they're actually meeting with civilian UFO organizations, um, their version of MUFON and, and others, to ask them their advice, to talk about cases they should look into, um, to hear their stories, and to work together. So they're working together with the civilians. So this is pretty incredible. Great news from Argentina, uh, taking a very proactive, uh, very open uh, approach to investigating UFOs. So really exciting news, and we have that story and all the uh, data on the, our website on that. Also, Jason and I have talked about this before, uh, even in detail about a video or some pictures that Jason got in Mexico using some of our equipment that's really high tech and uh, how, what he thought of what he had captured. So, and he even felt that this was possibly some sort of uh, living entity that he captured floating around in the sky. So, you can go to our website and see his video on that. Um, it's gotten very popular. Whitley Strieber posted it today. Um, we've gotten a lot of hits on that. So ch go check that out, too. And, um, s you know, Jason tells a whole story of how it happened and what he thinks there as well. So those are some of the cool stories that we have up right now on the website. So you're going to want to go check those out, openminds.tv. However, without further ado, let us go ahead. I'm really excited um, to get Steve Volk on the line. So let's talk with Steve Volk about Fringeology, his new book. All right. I am so excited, and I always say that, but uh, I always am usually. I'm so excited to have Steve Volk on the show. Steve, thanks for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. I've been looking forward to this. Well, I'm really excited about your book and the whole idea. I mean, it kind of draws upon my own experiences because I was really a journalism student when I right. really got involved with the paranormal, and it was kind of, you know, a similar. It's kind of like, well, let's look into this. I mean, you know, at first I blew it off, and uh, and when I took a hard look, it was like, wow, you know, I can't uh, blow all of this off. Um, yeah, I mean, obviously for me, I had, uh, in, in a way, a leg up on some people because I grew up with this kind of family ghost mm -hmm. story in my background. Um, and so I always had some sort of interest in the paranormal in general and a kind of uh, empathy for witnesses to strange things because it just seemed to me like in our situation, creaking floorboards and superstition couldn't account for it, you know? Mm -hmm. and And that's sort of the weather balloon equivalent of the description for ghosts, you know, right. uh, that the arch skeptic will give, right? Um, so I, I always just kind of felt like the explanation that's given should at least some, to some degree match what's been reported. Mm -hmm. and, and that's often not the case. So I, I came into it um, really just sort of interested in uh, delving into some of the areas I hadn't before, right? So I'd done some reading on these things. I'd certainly looked into ghosts quite a bit because of my own family background. But for me as a reporter now to take the skills I'd learned, I mean, I've been reporting for 15 years, mm -hmm. and to say, okay, how am I going to tell um, a, a really exciting and in some ways hopefully, you know, definitive UFO story? Right. And it was just a gas. Now, getting into you being a journalist, uh, and you mentioned this in the book, that kind of the rule of thumb uh, for journalists is to make fun of this, you know, go out during Halloween and film the ghost hunter and kind of uh, have some tongue-in-cheek uh, fun with it. Sure. Now, did you run across that uh, when you began as a journalist, and, and how did you – did you have a problem with that at first? Well, I mean, it, it's – in a lot of ways, it's not like it's ever even spoken. It's just sort of assumed. Mm -hmm. And I think it's just by tradition and custom, this is how these things are covered. Mm -hmm. You cover them at Halloween 
or you cover them in, right. in time with some big movie premiere. And you do it in a way that winks at the reader and lets the reader know, you know, you're not one of them. <laughs> right. And, and what's funny is, I mean, I'm, I'm not one of them. I, I have a very balanced view of this, I think. But at the same time... No, you're one of them. I've read your book. Sorry. I'm one of them. Well, which, <laughs> yeah. one, which one of them am I? No, the that's, I want to get into the them and the who's the them. Well, there's the, uh, depends, who them is it depends on which side of the fence you're standing on, right? Right. You know? Well, so you can tell me which one of them I am, I guess, as this moves well, on. I, I look say, forward to the diagnosis. Well, the hard part is uh, just by entertaining the idea to a lot of people, you're one of them. One of right, them. and I just think that's total BS. I mean, yeah, I think that's unfortunate. That, yeah, that position falls down and throws up all over itself before it even reaches the first hurdle. Um, <laughs> right. You know? If you don't look into something, you can't know what's going on. Mm -hmm. that, that, that part to me seems pretty clear. One, well, especially as a journal, journalist, that's what you do. You look into something. You take an unbiased look to take a to see uh, what's there, and uh, you know that's what I love about journalism. And what we try to do is, you're not making a, you're not forming opinions. You're informing about the facts. Well, and I have to tell you something else that's been important to my career as a journalist is I started out in alternative news weeklies, and I work at Philadelphia Magazine now and have for several years. And in both of those realms, one of the things we talk about and fess up to uh, is that true objectivity is impossible. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you, you come to this with some sort of worldview to, to yeah. begin with, whatever it is you're covering. And what's good about, say, the alternative weeklies, and for people who don't know what those are, it's like Think the Village Voice in New York, you know, um, that's the most f famous of them, or the Boston Phoenix in Boston. Mm -hmm. um, but every city, you know, most major cities have an alternative weekly. Right. Um, we allow for the fact that we have a worldview by going ahead and putting it on the page, you know? Right. And... Uh, so, and in here at Philadelphia Magazine, they always say, well, what's your take? You know, that's the phrase we use here. So, in other words, what, you know, where are you coming out on this story? Yeah. You know, what's, what's your position ultimately at the end of the day? I mean, I make an admission, I think, somewhere in here that one of the reasons I didn't look into alien abductions is because it was just sort of too much for me, mm -hmm. right? I mean, it was just that part was just somehow a step too far. I had a, I would have had such a hard time wrapping my mind around that as uh, that possibility and dealing with it head on, that I decided to stick to sightings. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I sort of admitted that I could have done it, sure, you know, but it would have been a bigger challenge. Right. And so I decided to just sort of table that. You know, the other issue for me doing this, and this is something I hope people come to understand about both UFO coverage in particular, since that's, you know, your focus and paranormal coverage in general, is that particularly with this book like this one, right? I'm, I'm getting into mental telepathy. I'm getting into ghosts. I'm getting into UFOs, spoon bending, uh, prayer, meditation, dreaming, a wide array of topics, each of which is the subject of books in and of itself that I'm right. doing at a chapter's length. So I also had to make decisions, real, really ruthless decisions early in the process. Where am I going to draw the line like, so I don't end up trying to cover everything and miss my deadline by five and a half years? Right. And, yeah, and I think where where UFOs are concerned, I mean, I, look, I'm over the last three years in particular, right? I mean, I've been listening to Coast to Coast constantly. I've been listening to this show quite a bit. I've been listening to lots of different paranormal radio shows and podcasts. And you hear hear people talk a lot about the media ignoring these things. I think one of the things that encourages the media to ignore them is that there's so much paperwork. And there's such a glut of, you know, cases that different people consider absolutely pivotal. It, well, you've got to know about this case. Uh -huh. and I remember, I can't remember who sent me an email, but at one point I got an email from some researcher telling me I had to look into the Trent, Trent case in uh, McMinnville. Mm -hmm. And then if I didn't, I, I just shouldn't even bother. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> and it's funny. like, look, you know, and that's a fascinating little case. I mean, I did look into it. It's a fascinating little case. Somebody could easily build a very worthwhile chapter out of that, but it's not as if there aren't, you know, tons of other cases that are worth looking into. Yeah. And so I think for, for a reporter who's looking at, well, I'm going to go ahead and cover this, a lot of times they're going to take the path of least resistance. Mm -hmm. And seeing the amount of literature that's out there, particularly on UFOs, I mean, it's, 
it is daunting, and a lot of decisions need to be made up front about what you're gonna what you're gonna read and what you're gonna cover. And yeah. I think for a lot of reporters, it's easier to just keep their tongue in their cheek, you know, r- write about the the standard template story and move on rather yeah. than do any actual research. Well, I learned what doing PR for MUFON uh, that uh, exactly that that you've got lots of people, even the MUFON people. And when we get into Stephenville, it was a perfect example of this, uh, are really upset with the media and how they cover it. Uh, so they aren't helpful with the media. Mm-hmm. And then, of course, they're surprised when the media doesn't cover it well. Or there are times, uh, I always took their perspective, help them out as much as possible and only give them the good, meaty stuff, which they love. They love meaty stuff. They love to say uh, a major said this or an astronaut said that. or. Right. Uh, in the Kucinich uh, situation that presidents had said uh, this or that. And so it depends on if you, if you give it to them, and you've got to talk to them in the first place in order to give them some of that good stuff. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, like I learned like what you said there, the media is largely lazy, and they're going to – well, they're, they're busy people. Yeah, um, I was going to say gonna, there's just so many deadlines stacked yeah, up. Yeah, I should – that's a better way to say it. Yeah. And then also they um, – they're going to want themselves to look good. Yeah. And you got to keep that in mind, and uh, sometimes that doesn't work in your favor, but if you're careful at crafting the way you communicate with them, it can work in your favor. Yes. I mean, I, I agree with all of that. And, you know, I had to deal, when you talk about the media, uh, you wouldn't believe, I, I call it the second head look mm-hmm. that I got a lot when I would, when somebody would say, <laughs> hey, I heard you're working on a book. What is it? Yeah. And when I'd tell them what it was, they would sort of rear back, and you could see they were just reappraising me on the spot. And mm-hmm. sometimes literally, and, it, and it's funny when you think about it because it's a subconscious reaction on their part, I think, they would literally look me up and down, like look mm-hmm. down to my shoes, you know, and up. Like maybe I'm going to be wearing clown shoes, I guess, suddenly. <laughs> right. And I think the reason they had to reappraise me was because, you know, they know me as somebody who goes to, like, Philadelphia's seediest drug corners and reports on what's going on there mm-hmm. and does you know a lot of street level journalism and covers politics in town and and these things are seen as so very very different you know but i mean at the end of the day a story is a story and i do feel like the media while I, i'm not sure that anyone should necessarily have a ufo beat right i think that might be a little much that's my beat yeah <laughs> I, I do think however that um From a journalistic perspective, you've probably heard the phrase low-hanging fruit, right? Mm -hmm. This is low-hanging fruit. You know, there's – these are dramatic stories that in some cases, uh, rightly or wrongly, right, they change people's lives. Right. Um, You've got generally sympathetic protagonists who uh, are people who are not deluding themselves, but they saw something they couldn't explain, and they're trying Mm -hmm. to, to reframe sometimes the whole world according to right what it was they just saw now me as a professional storyteller like that's great material to work with why mm-hmm. would i turn that down yeah. but the custom is to turn that down and to keep moving were you uh, hesitant to take this project on oh yeah and, and and i mean there were nights i have to be very honest with you even once i took it on and had the contract and all this sort of stuff <laughs> there were nights where it would just sort of hit me what i was doing Mm-hmm. And I would actually, like, wake up at 3 a.m. with my heart racing thinking, my God, what have I done? Because <laughs> my career is going just fine, you know. Mm-hmm. I'm real happy. And, and now I'm, people are forced by, by just the culture, in a way, to reappraise me. And do I, do I want to go through that? And I, I, what I kept coming back to was that these stories are just so common, you know, that, that – yeah. 20% of Americans, depending on the poll you're looking at, it's always around here, you know, Right. It report a ghost, around 20% report a UFO, uh, you know, having seen one. Um, uh, 30%, sometimes I've seen as high as 40% report some kind of psychic experience. Mm-hmm. And I'm not saying that all these experiences by any means are, are real, right? But, well, it's, it's always a real experience, you know, it's always a real experience. Right. Something happened that was odd. And that uh, this uh, person may still be trying to figure out. And for us to then stigmatize, gosh, when you look at that uh, Baylor religion survey, 68% of America holds some sort of paranormal belief, you know, whatever. 
whatever the subject might be, um, to stigmatize people over this stigmatizes such a massive proportion of the population mm -hmm. that just seems ridiculous. And so the book's in part uh, a permission slip for people to mm -hmm. tell their stories and, and be willing to consider all the possibilities right. uh, that might explain it. And that includes the mundane ones, but yes, goes all the way out into um, the, the ones that, that qualify as paranormal. At this point, do you regret writing the book? Not at all. Good. Not at all at this point. I'm very, very glad I did it at this point. I've gotten uh, a lot of good feedback, and um, it's, it, it is an incredible thing to go through the process and be able to look at the final product. Did you have any preconceived notions about the people you would be uh, interviewing or talking to when you started doing the research uh, that were changed? <sighs> That's such a good question. I, I think I've learned enough over the years that you've just got to um, go meet people and sort of take it on. Mm -hmm. And uh, my preconceptions, if this makes sense, end up being formed in the first few seconds I meet someone, and mm -hmm. sometimes those get exploded, if, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So, like, in other words, I, I head into everything before I met somebody, I think, with a pretty open mind because I've just learned that, you know, the sound of someone's voice on the phone doesn't tell you what they're going to look like. Right. The quotes you've seen in the paper don't tell you what wasn't quoted, you know, what they, what else they might have said or what right. else might be, be behind all that. So I really kind of take people on fresh when I go to meet with them. But but the funny part is the times when you first see someone and you have an impression of them and then that gets exploded, you know, like half an hour later or something mm -hmm. like that. Yeah. Like the first 30 seconds you might be thinking, ah, you know, I don't know about this guy. And then <laughs> – Half an hour later, they do something or say something where you're, you, they, they turn your head around. You know? yeah. um, one of the things I found is that some of the people, particularly in the UFO field, um, they have a source experience, I'd call it. Like, so they start talking to you about Nibiru and the alien implant in their arm that they don't actually want to get removed because – um, you know, they, they make they give you some reason for it, but it it just doesn't sound rational, right? Because if you have something like that in your arm, you'd figure you'd want to get it out and prove that it's there. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had I met a couple people like that who seemed more interested in being able to go to UFO conferences conferences and say that they have something in them than actually get it removed and verify that they have something in them. Right. You know, but with those. With, with those people as well, and I have to confess, when I hear this sort of thing, I would immediately be thinking, well, there's not going to be much for me here. And what I started finding out is that they had what I call this source experience. Something strange happened. They saw something that wigged them out, you know, that they couldn't explain. It sounds really odd. And that sighting or whatever it was sounds very credible in comparison mm -hmm. to the other stuff they're saying. And it kind of affected their filter, if you know what I mean. I know exactly what you mean. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so now they start viewing – I don't want to say everything. That's too big a word, right? But they right. start viewing a lot of things as potentially you know, either part of some conspiracy or strange or paranormal when they, the, those things might actually have a very reasonable explanation. But there's that, that core source experience that started it all. Mm -hmm. do, do you mind if I talk about something besides UFOs for a second? Some of the what? Something besides UFOs for a second. Oh, no, definitely, uh, you know, cover the, the gambit. And I was well, just going to say that, you know, I love the psychological aspect, too. And even with people who are, are very grounded people, I've seen exactly what you're talking about. They have an incredible UFO experience, but then all of a sudden, you know, they're seeing things that are definitely airplanes, and, and that's a UFO. They, they kind of... Their filter gets adjusted, like you're talking right, about. Right, right. And, and uh, so in, in the first chapter, I deal with Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, the lady who wrote On Death and Dying, the psychologist. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, famous book, kick-started the whole hospice movement uh, nationally and internationally. You know, rightfully one of the most important books of the last century. It's just, you know, it's rare to be able to say that about a book, but that one yeah. really qualifies. And... Um, Kubler-Ross, in the midst of researching what terminal illness was like for the people going through it, 
for the medical staff around them and for, of course, their loved ones and, and coming up with a kind of psychological diagnosis of all these people was also hearing these stories of near-death experiences. Mm -hmm. Now, that phrase hadn't been coined at the time. It was, you know, the mid-60s to late-60s when she was doing this work. And so this was stuff that nobody had heard about before. Um, there were other people I actually ran across in my research. There was an Army colonel named uh, Diane Corcoran, who was a nurse at the time, who uh, had an experience very similar to Kubler-Ross's and that she was hearing these stories from soldiers in Vietnam. But anyway, um, Kubler-Ross encounters the near-death experience, which I consider to be still unexplained. And it, and it doesn't mean that they won't eventually come up with a material explanation for it. I just don't think they have yet. Um, and so not to go too deep down that particular rabbit hole, but you know, the, the near-death experience, if it's brain-based, the different circumstances under which it takes place, it should produce a different experience, right? So mm -hmm. if somebody was under anesthesia or not under anesthesia, right. they were lacking for oxygen or not lacking for oxygen, it should produce some change in the experience because the brain is mediating everything we take in. But the skeptics don't really have a model for that yet, for how these big differences in the circumstances create any meaningful differences in the experience itself. So I consider it at this point still unexplained. So Kubler-Ross encounters this experience, and the next thing you know, man, you know, six years later, after on death and dying, she's writing the foreword for Raymond Mooney's Life After Life. That's fine. That's good. She's outing herself now as someone who had experienced these things. But in the backlash to that, when she was being criticized for having done that, she starts seeing psychics. She starts seeing um, really just occultists, frankly. And she ends up getting taken in by a con man. And it was a really long con, con that went on for a number of years wow. and did severe damage. I write about this in the book. It did severe damage to her credibility and her reputation. And it's a cautionary tale, the way I see it. But the one thing it doesn't do and the one thing it doesn't alter is that those initial experiences, I mean, it wasn't just one patient who told her about something like this. I talked to her, re, you know, her research uh, partner, the reverend she worked with at the time, and he said they had two of those long, deep, filing cabinet drawers just filled with near-death experiences and what they called deathbed visitations. So they encountered some real mystery, and it damaged her filter. That's mm -hmm. the only way to put it. And I, I just think that, that that goes on a lot. That's why I think, you know, reporting on – one of the reasons why reporting on it and communicating this sort of information is so important because in our, our Western thinking, our very rational uh, – logical kind of perspective, we don't prepare people for right. uh, the situation. Let's say they see a UFO, and like you explain, and like I try to explain, that just means unidentified. doesn't mean right. who knows what it's from. But they need to be uh, prepared to take some sort of action to alleviate the, even the trauma or the effects it has on them personally. Uh, and otherwise, I think stuff like this happens when they don't have an outlet. There's these extremes that people go to. And here's an example where, unfortunately, this person had a, a, ran into a lot of problems. Yeah. Oh, I mean, think about it. To go from really the height of her profession mm -hmm. to being a pariah, I mean, there are – you know, I'd have to think long and hard about – I mean, Michael Jackson fell that hard. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, that's the kind of cultural – yeah. icon you have to think about you know who else in in our the last 50 years has fallen to that degree yeah and unfortunately people do fall um and i think it's one of it's something you definitely tackle for instance let's take uh kusinich yeah uh you know he fell when he was interviewed very near the stevenville period of time on uh by tim Russert. And, uh, of course, asking him about his UFO sighting that was written about in uh, Shirley MacLaine's book. Right. And I thought, for me, and I would like to, to hear your perspective as well, um, it was kind of creepy when Tim, R Tim Russert asked that question and people laughed. Yeah. I um, See, and when we talk about him falling, now here's a guy who, as near as I can figure, I'm not sure that his filter was damaged by what he saw necessarily. I mean, I'm not sure he sure. fits that paradigm. But it shows you culturally that 
to just even go here at all mm -hmm. is verboten. Now, I think there's an extra layer to this also with, you know, Kucinich was considered this kind of marginal candidate to begin with. Mm -hmm. I do think even his physical stature and his appearance and the fact that people already described him as elfin didn't yeah. work in his favor. You know, so it was like the deck was just completely stacked against him. And, mm -hmm. you know, Tim Russert knew exactly what position he was putting Dennis Kucinich in. Uh, and just as a reporter, I'll tell you this, man. If I was going to do something like that to somebody on live TV, I would know in my heart that I'm about to wipe this guy out of the election. Right. And that's exactly what Russert did. It was – I mean, you know, Kucinich couldn't have begun with a more rational response. He, right. he said very forthrightly with no waffling when he said, you know, did you see a UFO is where I think Russert wrapped up his question. And he said, yes, right? So they're, you know, leaving no doubt and, and not seeming to hedge at, at all, which I really admire. And when you watch the YouTube video of it, it's pretty dramatic. But immediately people gasp and start laughing. Mm -hmm. and, and he, of course, reaches for what the definition of a, of a UFO is, people. It's an unidentified flying object. And, you know, I actually side with the people to some extent, even though I didn't get into this in the chapter, who want to go with UAP, right, unidentified aerial mm -hmm. phenomena. I have a lot of uh, respect for that position. But anyway, he starts to emphasize the unidentified part of that acronym, and, and the people won't let go. I mean, you just yeah. hear them continuing to titter and laugh. And his candidacy, while it was never going to result in the presidential nomination, was over in, mm -hmm. in those few seconds by, you know, this Tim Russert flash knockout by just invoking UFO at all. The staggering part about it to me, too, is, is that, look, I mean, Jimmy Carter talked about it. Reagan well, talked about it, you know. And Hillary Clinton. I mean, Hillary Clinton actually dedicated people to work with Lawrence Rockefeller on this. She actively was doing something uh, regarding UFO research, but, of course, and she was on stage right there. Yeah, it would have been interesting to pursue on that. I have to be tell you the truth. I didn't. I haven't done the the full load of research on on that. Yeah. There's that image of her with the book under her arm. Yeah. And and you know there's every possibility. And and again, I haven't looked into it. That you know, you have a guest and he gives you a book, and you you end up carrying it with you. you know, oh, there's she... more to that. You'd have to look at presidentialufo.com. Right. There are documents which show Rockefeller working with the president, uh, the advisor on science. And they talked about how they were channeling this information through Hillary Clinton's office, and her office was. And it was on about it. UFOs. Yeah. It wasn't about something else, because that's no, the other thing UFOs. I heard is that it might have been it's something else. Plainly, okay, well, definitely UFOs. There's another one then, but should we even need another one? Like see, that's what I mean. Like should we? We've yeah. got Carter and Reagan, and we've got just this whole yeah. history in which people yep. are seeing this, and all he's saying is he doesn't know what it was. Right. Calm down, people. Relax. Yeah. It was just kind of creepy <laughs> that they were just. Yeah, just uh, so I think people kind of wanted to uh, get rid of Kucinich anyways because they felt that his, his, he was frivolous and right. his campaign wasn't going anywhere, and so they right. wanted was, him out of the conversation. But right. So who knows if they would have reacted the same way if the question was asked to Hillary or something similar. But uh, it's an example of right just being associated with the topic um, kind of the hurting people's uh, – and, you know, I talked to the L.A. Times during that, and that's what I said. I said, unfortunately, you know, they, people bring it up in politics to hurt their opponents, and it works very effectively. But at least their coverage was pretty good on that story because I, I mentioned the other presidents, and they, they put that in there, and they, it had a serious tone. And I felt, and I get your perspective on this, too, because uh, most of your chapter on UFOs is around Stephenville, that Stephenville uh, in the media – even though there were aspects of it that weren't positive and spun in kind of a silly way, it still overall was treated uh, a lot better than, than some of the previous UFO stories. I, I agree with that. And uh, I think that when you consider the history of these reports, this was one of the better, uh, better treated groups of witnesses that you're going to run across. Mm -hmm. uh, at the same time, though, I do think that some of these, you know, the, the fact that the Walmart line got recycled again and right. again. Uh, Steve Allen, for those who, you know, 
need the background on this, had, had described the UFO initially as being as big as a Walmart. And that quote was continually recycled. And, you know, look, as a reporter, I, I printed it. Of course, I printed it in this context, but I, I would have wanted to print it too because it's just – it's fascinating and it's a colorful detail. Yeah. But it also serves to locate him in this very specific, you know, socio-cultural context, right, or socioeconomic yeah. context. And um, Ricky Sorrells – this is the one I don't think I would have done. He he kept being described as a deer hunter, mm-hmm. you know, and in that space, that parenthetical space where people will uh, insert between commas what someone's profession is, instead of saying machinist, you know, or instead mm-hmm. of describing as a, him as a husband and father, you know, they described him as a deer hunter. And that's certainly, I mean, it just sends that, that hick uh, label out there. And uh, and that to me was really unfortunate, and and that was one of the things I wanted to try and get across in that chapter is, you know, these weren't hicks, whatever that means, you know, to to people now. Um, these were, from what I could see and from the people I met, I mean, these were credible people who saw something that they couldn't explain, that mm-hmm. that sat outside, you know, all the normal boxes for them. Here's a question I have for you, and that's always been curious to me because um, I was there, you know, when the whole Stephen thing, Stephenville thing started, and uh, you know, I was working for MUFON, doing PR, and you know, talking to local news, talking to AP, talking to different news sources, all of the time. And there were lots of stories about UFOs, very similar to Stephenville, with multiple sighting uh, witnesses, people seeing something at night. Um, in rural locations, and in fact, not to just a few days before, there was a sighting in San Diego by some college students, some mm. of one of them, at least a physics student, and I thought that was a really interesting story, and I was excited for that one to, to blow up, and that was, uh, uh, Fox covered it. So I get the call from Angela, I work with her to get her with the move on people, get the call from the AP lady, which is exciting um, that she's going to write on it, but it's just kind of an everyday thing. I never could understand why that story blew up as opposed to the many stories that were very similar. In fact, some of them, like I said, in the middle of downtown San Diego. Yeah, you know, who knows what that alchemy is, right? I mean, mm-hmm. one of the things that I would say, and and I don't, I don't remember specifically everything that was going on at the time. Mm-hmm. Um, what else was happening that in that few day window? that allowed this to take off. So in other words, was there so little happening for whatever reason in that 48-hour time span or 72-hour time span when the when the story started to leak out of Stephenville that people felt like they needed something to run with? I mean, because to me what really made that story take off was the amount of uh, coverage CNN and Fox were giving it. Right. You know, when the national news agencies like that arrive, and I felt that their tone – was hugely respectful. Yeah, I felt that too. I mean, it was shocking. I was having Geraldo <laughs> kept calling me. His guys kept calling me. We want to send someone out. Where should we send someone? When can we send someone? Can you help us with this? Can you help us with that? And, you know, we've got, uh, well, why didn't you tell us that CNN was going to be there? And why didn't you tell me? And it's like, you know, <laughs> it was, we were inundated. And uh, that really surprised me that, uh, uh, it, I mean, it got that big and so much attention, like you said, from the, the big guys. I can tell you why I think it it happened now. I mean, I wanted to kick around a, 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 an idea or two there. Mm-hmm. But uh, t- to me, it's that you've got uh, multiple witnesses from different uh, angles and perspectives who weren't all seeing it together in one group, you know? And, and for me as a reporter, that starts to lend it credibility right away, that you know, that something a little odd must have been happening because you've got people who – it's not like they were all like – Steve Allen had a little group of friends out there. Well, it wasn't just Steve Allen and his group of friends that saw it. You know, There were other law enforcement – there were not other law enforcement. There was no law enforcement there, but there were law enforcement people that saw it from different angles, multiple law enforcement people. Mm-hmm. There were, um, you know, other citizens. I mean, it, they they sort of had this thing uh, staked out from a lot of different angles, and that's that's gosh, that gives it a lot of uh, 
a lot of weight. I mean, some of the the, the illusory sort of explanations fell down right away, like the the one about sunlight glinting off a jetliner. Yeah. Because, I mean, sunlight glinting off a jetliner, hey, look, I'll give you the benefit of the doubt, man, that that dramatic description that Steve Allen and his people described. I mean, I don't think they could be described, <laughs> could be explained by sun, sunlight glinting off a jetliner at all. But let's just even pretend that it could. <laughs> Why would somebody then uh, another mile or two over in another direction also see something? Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Because uh, those sorts of illusions are are very definitely based on you know the angle at which you're standing and perceiving this thing yeah. from. So so that one just right out of the gate was so laughable. Yeah, and then what uh, the other enigma for me with the media was that then the biggest part of the story I felt was it wasn't that big of a deal as far as sightings go until the radar analysis was done where uh, we had a radar expert and a guy at MUFON who were able to determine that there was radar uh, data from the FAA that could show that there was an object where those witnesses said it was, but that got practically no media at all. And if it wasn't for Angela helping us to get it on Larry King, it wouldn't have even gotten on there. Yeah, I mean, they they just moved on, and I think it shows you to some degree that, you know, when they were covering it, were th- were they ever necessarily taking it all that seriously. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I, I just still look back at that part of the episode, and I, I tried to view things a lot through the the lens of, you know, believer v. skeptic, right? And so, like, looking at um, the James McGahey explanation, McGahey ends up getting quoted uh, mm. saying that this – they they took a couple of hits from from the radar data and drew a line between them. And it was just such a um, convenient, and I certainly wouldn't want to accuse him of being willfully deceitful, but in, in the event, you know, it, it sort of turns out to be deceitful because that's not the track that's most interesting. You know, that that's the track that right. I suppose could be coincidence. I mean, the, the other track that's so fascinating is the one where they had over – you know, well over 100 straight uh, hits from a, a tower that wasn't malfunctioning. Um, and, you know, they had a radar expert in tow here who could tell them what are the signs of a functioning tower, and this was not a functioning tower. And it corresponded to some of the witness testimony. Now, here's my thing, man. That doesn't mean it was an alien spacecraft. Mm-hmm. I'm not saying it wasn't an alien spacecraft or that it was, but it definitely doesn't doesn't – mean that because there was something there that James McGahey can't explain, that aliens came to visit Stephenville. <laughs> but McGahey and the skeptics act like, they, they seem to me anyway, to act like if they just sort of throw their hands up in the air at some point, <laughs> or even give MUFON credit for having unearthed more than they gave them credit for, that somehow the whole world's going to fall apart. Yeah. If there was a UFO, if we, if we admit that there was something unidentified, we're all going to die, and, and the culture is going to end. <laughs> I it's think, ridiculous. Yeah, I think you, you mentioned we've touched on false certainties, which you talk about in the book, on yeah. both ends, such as McGahan's sure. and his false certainty that there wasn't anything uh, there. Uh, it was just radar without you know looking fully at the evidence. And on the other side, we've talked about believers and how sometimes people will uh, have these false certainties that there's something going on where there isn't something going on. And this aspect of false certainties, you talk about how that's dangerous, and especially when people take it to these extremes. And I think, yeah, like you said, it it is one of those unfortunate aspects, um, but it's kind of the middle ground is not as interesting. It doesn't seem, and I could see that, where the media would want to pick up on, it's not as interesting to cover some guy who says, I don't know. It's more interesting to cover some guy who says, damn it, this is it. You know what, though, and, and I and I hear you, and I and I understand where you're coming from. I really do. But I think if people thought about it for a beat, right? If the media thought about it for a beat, I don't know is where the fun starts. I agree. Because that's, that's where I am. Yeah, there's a mystery there. Mm-hmm. And who doesn't want to solve a mystery? I mean, here's my thing. I don't think that people like uncertainty. In, in general. And, and look, I'm a person. I don't like uncertainty. <laughs> right. But I, I, I tried to get comfortable with it as I kept running into it again and again. And I found that 
you know, the, the more I ran into it, the easier it got to sort of tolerate. Um, so, so people see UFO, right, and they see unidentified there, and I think they, the instinct is to force a conclusion on that mystery. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, it was a weather balloon or the military three weeks later said they were dropping flares, so that must be what they saw. Mm-hmm. Um, and on the other end, it's, well, you know, I guess it was, it was E.T. And, and, of course, the worst thing you run into on the, on the real hardcore UFO end is the people who know it had to be like some people from Nibiru, you know, right. who, who were actually in that craft. Yeah. Um, and, and so they, they force a false conclusion on what remains a mystery. And I, mm-hmm. I, I just – I think that, you know, in, in that space where something's unidentified, one of the things we can do, like one rational response, is to just enjoy the story. Yeah. I mean, it's a fantastic story, what happened in Stephenville. And uh, the fact that there isn't a, a firm conclusion on it yet – uh, it might make it hard, I guess, to shoot the feature film in some respects, but I, <laughs> I think it could be all the more poignant for that. Yeah. The feature film, they'll come up with a conclusion. I would assume that they would, although I, I think that, you know, not knowing what it was, um, the people in Stephenville, to my mind, have been finding their own conclusions. And I don't necessarily mean that they've been, they've been then, you know, forced to one of these false certainties. I think that they've largely, as a town, been working on making peace with the fact that this weird thing happened and no one's sure what it was. Mm-hmm. And, I, yeah. and I, yeah. Oh, I was just going to say, I, I, you know, it's something that I, I repeat over and over uh, on this show. And the most, the people I respect the most who I bring on the show are those who are willing to admit they don't know. Typically, when you go to a lecture or you start a book on the paranormal, where they say, "I've." got it all figured out it's most likely not going to be a very good book or a lecture um well, but I to, <laughs> I when they say i don't know it's usually like why well, that's where you're going to learn the most and these these people say and the people who have been researching the most and especially scientific minded or often say they they don't know i i gotta i gotta share this with you i've done like something like 20 interviews now and um it's been really fascinating to me how some people get so disappointed. Like when I, <laughs> when I, you know, there's probably been about six interviews, six of the 20, five or six of them, somewhere in there, because it's not like I've been keeping this as a statistic, but I feel like once, you know, every five or six interviews I do, when I, when I just say, well, you know, I, I don't really know what it was, mm-hmm. there's this kind of gasp yeah. on the other end. And I think it's because they're used to people, if they wrote a book about it, it's because, <laughs> yeah. you know, they're claiming to have found the conclusion. Right. But, I mean, that's just total BS. Uh-huh. I mean, and, and, you know, they may have found – here's the thing. They may have found a plausible or semi-plausible conclusion. And, and, like, the skeptics will put something forward and say, well, this is, you know, more likely statistically or whatever since we, we know that weather balloons exist and we don't know that alien spacecraft exists. Well, I'll even concede that a prosaic explanation is, quote, more likely. But it doesn't mean it was the explanation. And it mm-hmm. doesn't mean it was – it's now – explained unless you really have enough data to demonstrate that this was what it was. Mm-hmm. Was there a weather balloon in the area, pal? You know? If not, then you've just got an idea. Right. <laughs> like you, you don't, don't have an explanation. Have you've out. got a thought. Congratulations. I've got some yeah. too. It's still a UFO. And, and, you know, and I think that what it is from the skeptical point of view, I mean, I think that, in that because in an unidentified space, people can leap in and then say, well, it must have been alien. They feel like they've got to guard against that, and I think they undermine their own cause uh, mm-hmm. drastically because they start to seem irrational. Right. Like they're, they're so committed to explaining it away that it's like a religion. Yeah. Yeah, and when I've, – I've have found that there are – especially with the, the conventional media, um, when you tell them, I don't know – they respect you as an investigator or researcher of the paranormal more because they can see that, okay, it's someone who's interested in looking into it, but they're not going to give us some really zany kind of answer. And I've gotten some good responses that way, and I think luckily I've been able to create some research or some uh, uh, 
relationships with some people that way. Uh, I think from you know, and I think in your context, right? As the guy who, um, and forgive me, I can't remember now. I think you you moved on from Mufon, right? Yeah, yeah. Because um, when I met you, you were with Mufon. Uh, in in your context, as a guy who's running a podcast on UFOs, I mean, I think people would expect you to be this kind of pie-eyed believer. And when you're willing to say, I don't know, it, it does give you tremendous credibility. Now, on the other hand, for me as an author, when I say I don't know, there's this sense of like, well, what's your book about then? Because <laughs> <laughs> right. and, and, usually people write books claiming they've got the answer. And, and, and my right. point in this is that, you know, I don't know is often where we're at, and then we plaster it over with a bunch of garbage, right? right. Like with our own beliefs. Mm -hmm. And that's a lot of what I'm trying to get at in the book. I mean, you know, even with the, the old family ghost story, I'm not saying ghosts exist or that they don't. I'm saying that, you know, we, we can't go back at a time capsule and gather enough data from those days to determine what was really going on in my house in 1975. We are left in uncertainty. And people can create what, whatever kind of, um, you know, narrative they'd like to explain what it was. And, and I guess if that helps them get through the night, like have a nice night's sleep, you know. But the fact is, it's, it's still unexplained. Doesn't mm -hmm. mean it was a ghost. Doesn't mean it wasn't. And yeah. I just think that's, that's how the paranormal lines up a lot of the time. I and mean, we're yeah. dealing with eyewitness reports. We're dealing with a subjective assessment of what, was, what these people saw. See, and I love that. I think that may be one of the most the, uh, helpful contributions society that paranormal research can have is to get people to a place where they're comfortable to say, I don't know, because I don't know is opens up uh, great possibilities. Anything's possible. And then more than that, it keeps people from uh, diluting themselves and coming up with these, like you said, the, the false certainties that just are, are just as irrational on either side. Yeah, and I, I don't know if you'll agree with this or not. I, I'm, you know, I'm not clear on how much of the book you've read, and, and you know, there's always the possibility that I've failed, right? But my, my <laughs> idea in writing the book was to write a book, and, and, and this, look, this developed over time, too, as I did the research, um, to write a book that has ghosts and UFOs and mental telepathy and spoon bending and all these things in it, right? But it's not necessarily about those things, or, or at least it's not only about those things. I mean, at the end of the day, I think this is a book about us. You know, mm -hmm. this is a book about what it means to be human. And I, and I think we have brains built to bring us to a conclusion. You know, uh, the, when, when we don't know what something is or we don't know what to make of information, we get a lot of anxiety messages within our own brains. And it's like uh, it's that sort of Danger Will Robinson moment from – lost in space, you know, mm -hmm. with a robot. Alerts going on up there. Yeah, you know, that uh, we we got to figure this out. And so people will immediately move toward uh, a territory that's more safe, where they have some definition. That's part of humanity. And so I agree with you fully when you say that the paranormal is this sort of great jumping off point for people to understand that there are, we don't have all the answers. And that, you know, in that space, there's, um, there's a real freedom to create and think and hypothesize what might be there. And I also think there's a great space to get together, you know. Mm -hmm. Like if we could get Joe Nickel to admit that there's something he can't explain, yeah. you know what I mean, or, or McGahey, and then have them sit down with Stanton Freeman. They may uh, have a story. I'd love to, you know, be able to talk to <laughs> McGahey and unravel this story where he was, you know, last week in his closet crying because he thought a monster was in his house. <laughs> <laughs> you know, what, he may have his own story. That would be awesome. <laughs> yeah, that would we, be You know great. what, we should write one. I love that idea, <laughs> too, of just him in the corner. <laughs> but, you know, like, t to me, that space of uncertainty or mystery really is a place where people can get together, mm -hmm. you know, and yeah. maybe let their guards down a little bit and understand yeah. that we are in this together. Yeah. Yeah, I love that, and I love that you covered all the different aspects because I think it's it's another funny quirk that there are probably people listening to the show right now who are UFO people who are thinking, oh man, ghosts, that's just a bunch of hooey, and uh, you know, just no. as closed-minded about other paranormal phenomena 
than the one that they subscribe to. And I've certainly ran across that, which is another strange dynamic that I find because, uh, as you mentioned in your book, you know, there's still, when, especially when you're asking people, well, religion's kind of the same thing. When you're asking people to accept that I can't prove something, but I believe it, and I, I ask you to respect my belief, but you're not willing to do the same for others. You know, you know, one of the things I've come across because, you know, in giving, in doing sort of public appearances to promote the book and that sort of thing, I mentioned those statistics that I mentioned earlier about 20% mm -hmm. have seen a UFO and 20% of a ghost. And I've run into a lot of people later on who say, well, but aren't they the same 20%? Like very dismissively because they don't yeah. believe in either of them. And they're not. They're not the same not 20% at all. at all. And I actually, I don't have the numbers in front of me. I've been meaning to go back and look them up. But like out of the Baylor Religion Survey, for instance, they're not the same 20% in the least. Yeah. And, um, you know, and that, and that really starts to widen the pool of people who would claim definitely some sort of paranormal experience. That's what I was thinking of when you were going over those stats, because I, I actually do. I've helped for years held a lecture series on uh, different aspects of the paranormal. I've gone on plenty of ghost hunts and even a Bigfoot hunt here and there. And oh, I mean, I've gotten involved great. with all of it just to kind of just look and discover and, and see what people are saying um, because I think these things are sociologically interesting. Yep. And unless you can definitely disprove something, you know, I think it's wise to keep an open mind to it because what if there's something there? Yeah, you know, um, it's, it's funny you bring the Bigfoot up, one up. I was going to write a chapter on Bigfoot, and mm -hmm. I decided not to. And one of the things I was going to explore is the idea that, um, you know, a among the most responsible s sorts of researchers, and I have no opinion on Bigfoot, but mm -hmm. I, I thought it was a good way to sort of analyze the sorts of things we're talking about. Right. When you listen to, like, the Lauren Coleman's of the world, they're not describing a paranormal creature, you know? They're, they're not describing something that exists outside the realm of science. I mean, w is it really outside the realm of science to discover an unknown animal? Heck no. Right. We do it every year. You know? mm -hmm. Now, this one would be particularly unusual, but when you filter through some of the, the more odd aspects of the reports, which are actually fairly rare. I mean, usually people are talking about, I mean, just from the, the little cursory reading I did, to consider using it as a chapter. Um, you know, they're usually describing what sounds like an animal, you mm -hmm. know, and and so I don't I don't get it, man. Like I just don't get it where there there becomes this fence erected that somehow uh, if someone's interested in going out and looking for Bigfoot over the weekend, that they're they're um, they're deficient in some way. I mean, it, it it's simply not the case. Yeah, and. Oh, man, I had a good point. <laughs> I forgot the question yeah. for you, but I lost it well, you can on that out. aspect. But, <laughs> uh, yeah. But, you're, I, you know, there's, there's cryptozoological especially is, is along those lines. But, uh, yeah, it keeps coming back to, like you mentioned, and I just love the, uh, the whole phrase of false certainties because yeah. you find a lot of that and where really – uh, it perplexes me and some of these skeptics, uh, especially the scientific sort, because it kind of counters scientific at being an ultimate skeptic because uh, science has always been found in those areas. And you even get into this where uh, people are exploring beyond their comfort uh, realm. Uh, you know, you mentioned about how a lot of the discoveries people make are not in the lab, but in the shower or driving down the street. Right, right. And I, my favorite story like that is the Hans Berger story. Um, and I, I guess it was during World War One, and he was a soldier, and um, he fell off a horse and was nearly killed by an artillery uh, sort of b brigade that was behind him, you know, a horse-drawn artillery carriage. And the, the driver managed to bring it to a halt, and he, but he had a moment where he thought for sure he was about to die. And when he got back uh, to the barracks or whatever, there was a telegram, and his sister had been worried that um, he was in grave danger. And, you know, her fear was from around the, the same time as this incident, and he took it as, as not to be a coincidence. And so he started off on a search for what physical mechanism could explain this and settled on electricity. 
and eventually invented, you know, despite the derision and howls of protest from scientific colleagues, he eventually invented the EEG and found there is electrical activity in the brain. I mean, you know, <laughs> people, the world is like worth exploring, you know, yeah. Let, let's, let's do it and, and do it with an open mind and who knows what we'll find. I mean, I, I, uh, I just think that's a fabulous story because the EEG just became sort of right. the foundation of modern neuroscience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so if you have people complaining about what you're doing, it probably uh, you're headed in the right direction. Well, see, and, and that's right. That's a, it's an interesting point, and I know you're overstating it to make the point, right? I mean, sometimes people are complaining, and there there really is bad science going on. But it's also true that you know, very very possibly, the the best discoveries that we'll be looking at 20 years from now will be things that a handful of people were saying, hey, guys, look at this. Hey, guys, look at this right, right now. And, and that's a, a part of the history of science. And mm -hmm. so whenever people sort of guard the current store of knowledge rather than guarding the method, you know, like the scientific method, my antenna go up because science isn't its current base of knowledge. Science is its method. And the, the base of knowledge is always changing. You know, mm -hmm. people are always learning more. Right. Now, I want to get back before, because we're starting to run out of time. Uh, one question was, when it came to UFOs, because you did, uh, you know, you had those ghost stories uh, in your family, and so you were open to that uh, particular subject. How did you feel about the UFO phenomenon prior to investigating it for the book? Uh, 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 interested, right? And... Mm -hmm. um, I had read books already over the years, you know, here and there. It, it, but I have to admit, you know, it's not like it was a passion. So it was a really enjoyable chapter to do in that way because I was I was able to enter into it um, really fresh. Mm -hmm. And I had a very open mind on the topic because, look, I, I'm still waiting for a smoking gun, you know. Right. B but at the same time. Aren't we all? <laughs> <laughs> I love the way your voice fell there. <laughs> but at the same time, I think a lot of the arguments that come up against this sort of, you know, interstellar travel are just funny, you yeah. know, because they're based on what we know about the world right now, and yeah. we're ba they're based on the technology we can conceive of right now. And that is on its very face. Now, look, I understand that those things are important, but they're not authoritative. They don't close the discussion because – you know, in the last hundred years, and I write about Edgar Mitchell in the book, in a hundred years, his family went from traveling west and covered wagons to putting him on the moon. Right. So what will we accomplish in the next hundred years or the next 500 years? It is laughable to me when yeah. people just sort of snort derisively and wave their hand and say, well, that sort of thing is impossible. It's just a non-starter of a claim. Well, the people who have done that in the past when it comes to flight or crossing the ocean or anything at they, they, they're the fools, the skeptics, when it came to. Sure. Um, you know, and another comment that you made, which I thought was great, and it's something that uh, I've said before, too, is when people ask, well, why would they do that? Why would they go to, you know, this middle of nowhere in, in Texas? And uh, like you, similar to what you're saying now, you know, if they exist, if there are aliens, they'd be alien by definition. We would have no idea. And I often, when people ask about motives, say, I have, we have, there's no way we can have any idea behind motive of why someone might be doing something. All we can do is follow the data. The and, data. and, you know, I have to tell you, and that also reflects such a cultural bias, particularly where a place like Stephenville is concerned, because you'll, you'll hear people say, well, why would they go to a cow right. town? And, you know, as if a aliens are going to be interested in uh, the Met, you know what I mean, <laughs> right. like more, more naturally. I mean, yeah. it, it just—it's it, another claim that just sort of—it's it, just laughable on its face. I had a great time in Stephenville, for that matter. <laughs> mm -hmm. Let me point that out. I live in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. I love it here. It's a big, big city. You know, I love it here. Maybe they went there because they thought it would be a great time. You know what I mean? I'd have no clue. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Until we can ask. <laughs> right. Until we can converse with them. You know. I Who's heard it was say? Great. <laughs> yeah.
Uh, they, I'll tell you what, the Heart 8 Barbecue would be worth coming in for. By the way, a funny story there, Alejandro. I went into this place called the Heart 8 Barbecue in Stephenville because, I mean, I wanted to, you know, while I was there, I wanted to enjoy Texas. Uh-huh. And Texas culture needs some good barbecue. And I go in there, and the song uh, Third Rock from the Sun was playing. Oh, that is funny. It was absolutely awesome. I just burst Perfect. out laughing. It was terrific. I know Angela would enjoy that, too. Yeah, oh, it was absolutely terrific. I had a great time with her as well. I mean, she was a good interview. And, uh, you know, the people of Stephenville, and I don't know how you feel about this, and I know you need to wrap it up, but I would just say this. The, the people of Stephenville, I think, also provide a kind of lesson for the rest of us mm-hmm. in terms of how to handle this. Because you're talking, you know, and by this I mean the paranormal, because you're talking about a town of 17,000 people where they all know each other and feelings can run awfully hot, you know, and they're finding a way to coexist and continue on with life as they knew it in spite of the fact that this very strange thing happened in town. And, and, and by the very strange thing, I would include, you know, the media hitting them right. like crazy, you know, and becoming a media center where they never thought that that would ever happen to them. And the decision the town had to face as to whether or not to embrace an identity as kind of like a UFO mecca or not. And the tension that developed between the people who were embarrassed by the fact that a UFO was seen there and the people who simply want to know what the UFO was, they've gotten along in spite of all that. And they were so careful and so kind and so caring when they talked about people on the other side of the fence. You know, after spending months and months and months mired in the literature going back and forth between (laughs) skeptics and believers, it was so refreshing to Mm -hmm. see real people focused on caring a little bit about one another and getting along. Yeah, I love that part in your your book because it's always – we shouldn't have to avoid talking about religion and politics or paranormal. You know, we should be able to be civil with each other and respectful for it with each other talking about differing opinions. And it's unfortunate that it's almost a rule of thumb that you don't go there because, you know, and decidedly we don't know how to be civil talking right. about those subjects. Right. Well, you know what? I loved the chapter of the book on Stephenville. I think you got the bigger story there with not just how people reacted and treated each other, but uh, how the, the media handled it, um, the, what these people were like. I think that you were able in one chapter to encapsulate the Stephenville situation on a bigger scale and how it relates to all of us, uh, more so than anything I've read on Stephenville or really on UFOs. Oh, so, thank you very much. I thought it was awesome. Uh, I haven't finished the whole book, and I'm so excited to finish the book because I just really love the perspective, uh, not just the openness, but just the frankness and really grounded down-to-earthness of the book. Um, so I'm very excited about it. Thank you so much for writing it. Oh, uh, You know what, man? Thanks for all those kind words, and thanks for having me. I, you know, I listened to this show many times <clears throat> as part of my research. And, uh, you know, it's, it's a kick to be on here now myself. Cool. Yeah. Well, we'll have you on again because I feel like I just scratched the surface of some of the stuff I wanted to talk about with Great. you. So, uh, Great. So it was a lot of fun. Okay. Um, thanks a lot, Andrew. All, All right. right. Thank you. All right. Steve Volk, ladies and gentlemen. So really neat guy, you know, a, a very thoughtful uh, person. Um He's put a lot of thought into this, and, and the book shows that. So I, I think he brings a fresh new perspective to this whole thing, and that's why I really enjoyed the Stephenville thing. I mean, it reminded me, of course, of what went down when all of that happened, but uh, he was able to touch on aspects that others hadn't touched on and some of the importance um, of that case that others haven't touched. Uh, gotten on to either so I'm very excited about his book I love the UFO chapter I've loved some of the other stuff and I can't wait to finish it it's a great read so I didn't want to put it down uh, but I had to because I had to go back to work and I had to do the interview and stuff or else uh, I'd be reading it probably right now people we are out of time, my fine friends. Thank you for listening to Open Minds Radio. Don't forget to visit openminds.tv for more UFO news. Next week, we'll be on the air, and we will have Mystery Guest X. Why is it a mystery? 
because I'm not quite sure, to be honest, uh, who we're going to have on next. But it's going to be someone exciting. I have a lot of ideas and a lot of people I want to bring on. Uh, I was holding out for some MUFON guests to hear back because uh, I'm helping them uh, with their symposium. So possibly a MUFON lecturer. But if I don't hear from a MUFON lecturer by tomorrow, I'm going to go ahead with some of the other really cool guests that I have been holding on to. It's going to be a great show next week. Either way, people, thanks for joining us, and we will talk to you then.